Hello, it's Philip Taylor speaking from Richmond Green Chambers in London. This morning I'm looking at a book from Oxford University Press. It's a fascinating book and it's the age-old problem of freedom of expression and privacy. This is called um, Tugendhat and Christie on the law of privacy and the media. Now that's what I'm calling it. I don't actually have the word on in the title, but it was originally uh, written by um, Toon Hat and Christie, and it's now got some uh, new editors in addition. That's N.A. Morham and Sir Mark Warby. Now, Elizabeth and I um, discussed this book in detail, and Elizabeth has written most of the review for this book, and she's given it this title. The foggy boundaries between privacy and freedom of expression are examined in the definitive work of this definitive work of reference, now in a new third edition. <clears throat> Let's have a look at the book first of all. It's a red cover. It's a heavy book. Um, that's the front, then there's the spine. There's nothing on the back. And then the book, if I open it at the back first of all, a uh, lovely page is beautifully presented. 800 odd pages. Um, there is the index. The index is actually by paragraph numbering, so you can find things very quickly. It's quite a detailed index, very much the house style for OUP, I hasten to add. And then you've got the actual, right at the back, the last page, you can see paragraph numbering very much to the fore at the side there. And then you've got a lot of footnoting, huge amount of footnoting, and a lot of justification for all the assertions made. And rightly too, this is a, this is a very, very a topical area, but a controversial area. And, of course, it depends on where you fit in on this, because this is the third edition, and now, now Two and Hat and Christie are the consulting editors, as two new people have taken over. There's some basic blurb about the, uh, um, the book, and then there's a forward, which is, again, very important. We start off with Guess Who. That's right, Naomi Campbell. <laughs> we can't get away from her. There we go. It start, it's even mentioned again in the forward. There, there, there's the basic detail. Um, the actual forward was written in October 2015, I'm recording this at the beginning of 2016. There's a preface, which is well worth reading, to set the scene by, it's written by Nicole Morham, there we go. And then we've got acknowledgements, and then we get into the book itself. Um, the summary, the uh, contents, and you see a number of people are involved, of course, in writing some of the chapters. Um, and there we go, we've got 15 chapters in the various parts. In fact, there are eight parts in total. And then there's a detailed series of contents. Again, it is by, with the actual, um, straight, the simple content section, it's page numbering, but it then goes into paragraph numbering for something specific. So the content runs through for quite a long way. Then after that, you've got the tables of, of cases, of course, a lot of them. And then after that, you've got Table of Adjudication of Media Regulation, and you've got a lot of the Table of Legislation, of course, a lot of the additional information that you'll be looking for. You've also got International Treaties and Conventions. Again, an important area, developing area here. We're getting more of this in these books today than we had before. This is the list of contributors. A lot of people involved in this. It's a very substantial work. And then the foreign law contributors are there. Then we get into the book itself. And you've got a very useful short index at the front of each chapter, which you can just see to see what's actually in the chapter itself. Then, as I said before, you've got the paragraph numbering at the side there and footnotes. And then you run, run all the way through. And in fact, just opening in the middle, specific types of harassment. Right. Now, the point about this book, of course... It depends on your point of view, to a certain extent, as to what you think about privacy and the media. Because I'm a journalist, as well as a barrister at law, and I have to declare an interest, and that is, and Elizabeth and I certainly both do, we actually believe that a freedom of expression is actually more important than privacy. And I'm afraid, I think we're in a minority, but we'll get on to that in a minute. Uh, what we're saying here is this book, says the co-editor, Sir Mark Warby, is not an academic treatise, but a practitioner's textbook. Quite right, too. It's detailed, but it's actually reasonably easy to read, too, and you can find things quickly. It goes on to say that the practitioner's insight is an enormously important part of this work. It's obviously newly published by OUP in its third edition. 
So as I say, now in the third edition, it's a long established, I think we can say, and authoritative work of reference, which is an absolute boon to practitioners in this, what is a difficult field of law, where more often than not controversies continue to rage. So within almost 900 pages, the book contains the insightful and not altogether non-controversial commentary of some 29 erudite contributors, including the two um, editors and interestingly nine foreign law contributors from as many jurisdictions and I think a useful feature here is this for comparative uh, lawyers. The wealth of new material and commentary in this third edition reflects the significant developments in this area of law that have emerged since the previous edition was available in 2011. And the co-editor Nicole Morham mentions that in addition to a number of brand new chapters, there is much additional updated content which examines recent issues and events, including the advent of the Independent Press Standards Organization, which was formed after Leveson, which, as she points out, was certainly prominent in raising public awareness of media privacy issues like never before. Again, that depends perhaps on your point of view. What is apparently not mentioned here is that little matter, of, the, the little matter of almost 30 or so journalists who were tried and actually eventually acquitted following the expenditure of a very large amount of time and a very substantial amount of public money. It could be concluded, at least tentatively, that the public do not necessarily agree slavishly with those voices in the legal establishment who are inclined to favour privacy over free speech. And I'll leave it as far as that. Some observers commented privately that the Leveson inquiry looked just a little star chamberish, or for that matter, inquisition-ish. And I'll leave all the voters out there to decide what they think, which is pretty cynical, I'm afraid, judging by what I've seen on the doorsteps as a, as a politician. What has to be noted, I think, as well, especially by argumentative lawyers, is that there has been a long tradition, or at least a tendency among certain senior elements of the judiciary, to support the right to privacy over freedom of expression. Now, I'm not mentioning names. I have met one or two of them and interviewed one or two of them. But I'm not mentioning any names. It's often claiming this is what could be called an orthodox view, ostensibly supporting uh, the concept of the right to a family life clause in the Human Rights Act, which, of course, the Daily Mail in particular does not like at all. And, of course, there is this terrible confusion between things like the European Convention on Human Rights and the whole of the dreadful Brexit, uh, Brexit issues that currently we're facing with the referendum. Frankly, it got very little to do with it, in my view, and I would submit strongly that this book itself, not political at all, uh, and not taking sides, is trying to set the law out as we have it at the moment. Whether we like it or not is another matter. But in fact, they, they have achieved their aim brilliantly, in my view. So the learning outcome for all of this is that, yes, I think we know a little bit more about where we are. And I'm afraid my conclusion, um, I may be in the wrong here, but my conclusion is that, in fact, where there's a collision between uh, privacy and freedom of expression, privacy seems to rule, as long as you've got enough money in your bank account. And of course, examples of the disparity, uh, the disparity between public opinion and what judges think emerge all the time. And in fact, there's a quote when we were doing this review, which was in the Times, quote, threesome must stay secret to protect couples' privacy. Trump is a headline in the Times. This was actually on the 23rd of March, 2015, uh, 16. And explained in the first paragraph, quote, that judges, this is in the Court of Appeal, ruled that a couple could be considered committed despite having an open relationship, i.e. having sex with other people. They ruled, writes the Times Legal Editor, that's the excellent Francis Gibb, that the right of this public figure, an entertainer, no name of course, to a private and family life outweighed the Sun on Sunday's right to publish an article about his adultery under laws on freedom of expression. Now, you can see there is a real balance here between the two. But, of course, if they're well known, they've got a lot of money, it's rather different from the ordinary guy 
in in the terraced house in in some suburb somewhere who's not actually got a lot of money to go to court to fight a particular case if he or she wanted to or hasten to add. So if by chance you regard this example I've given as a judicial assault on the beleaguered fourth estate, pity, if you will, the poor legal beagles tasked with arguing the case for those poor news hounds who had the temerity to sniff out a juicy story. Perhaps, say, said lawyers, should have read this book first, especially paragraph 5.144 on page 258 and paragraph 11.74 in the excellent article on justifications and defences written by the co-editor uh, Warby and Victoria Shaw. Now, as I said before, we're not actually on a soapbox here doing anything, but what we've got is the balance between the two arguments, because don't think we're ever really going to get much of a decision and cases will be taken on the basis of what has been going on recently. There is the danger with the issues of access to justice and cuts in legal aid that in fact there's a two-tier legal system. One for those with a lot of money and one for those, or in fact nothing, for those who don't have the money. That of course is another political issue but we do see it in the courts today <clears throat> and of course do remember with litigants in person a large number of the litigants in person do tend to be defendants because they don't have the money for lawyers. Now enough of, again, of the soapbox element. Let's go back to the book. The judges in this particular case I've just been talking about rejected what is known as the public interest argument, i.e. we want to know who the entertainer is. But supporting the principle, the media should be allowed to set the record straight where a public figure has presented a false image to the public. Well, we've seen that with a number of people who are currently doing a little bit of custody time for their appalling behaviour. Now, anybody who's been involved in show business, as I have, and has seen the way that they behave, um, you take a rather different view. And the fact is that an awful lot of people know what's going on. But the very large bulk of the people out there don't. And that's really where the protection element comes in. Um, but here, of course, in this particular case, the judges said the individual had not deliberately set out to mislead the public. That was a finding of fact by the judges, which we re respect, of course. So, as I said, they're taking each case, I think, on their individual facts. One can conclude from this, possibly can one, that if you're in public life, it's OK to present yourself as a wholesome person when you're aren't, as long as you haven't set out to do it deliberately. Right or wrong, then, this tortuous argument is almost guaranteed to puzzle the public even more and generate yet more controversy. Of course, I have to say that there is the titillation element, which, of course, certain newspapers are delightfully keen to pursue. But the point I would make is that that, that, that is relevant in the sense that when you are looking at the concept of, of a deliberate approach, frankly, an awful lot of people um, in public life are presenting an image and quite often they're nothing like the image you actually see on the telly especially if you live in a community as I do here in Richmond where you've got a lot of famous people you see them in a rather different way and some some are totally different and some are exactly the same whether they're in public or private life. Let me again come to a conclusion anyway with this book. Clearly the free speech versus privacy debate is a subject on which just about everybody has an opinion, which makes the publication of this book all the more timely, and I think it sh certainly should be available in every newspaper office. Note that it contains extensive commentary on the internet now and social media issues, very important, with which the law still struggles to catch up, both in the criminal and the civil jurisdictions. It's still quite outrageous. And it, it's happening even as I speak with certain people making certain comments about social media fact is that they still have not identified how important it is and there is still that catching up to do. It's an exquisite and unpalatable irony then that professional journalists have often had to labour in fear of arrest while trolls and terrorists continue with impunity to spread their venom all over the net under the cloak of anonymity. That day must end. When it will I don't know. You're always going to have a certain element of it. It's the old stuff on the lavatory wall which we had when I was a child uh, which you can rub off when it's actually on the internet it's not the same thing at all and the trouble is 
the people who perpetrate this sort of thing, they've got the brains of little children and the nastiness of, of really psychotic madmen sometimes. But that's the way it is and we've got to police it properly. Again, that's a matter for the future. But this book, I think, does help because it identifies what the issues are with privacy and the media. Let me conclude, if you're a practitioner then seeking to explore in uh, Warby's apt phrase, the foggy boundaries between privacy and freedom of expression. This is a book you'd do well to acquire. Certainly all editors and journalists should see it. It's easy to use, I think. I like the paragraph numbering. You can find things quickly. It's well footnoted and it presents a rich vein of references for further research. So we think media lawyers, those are the guys looking at the stuff being produced six or seven o'clock in the evening for the next day. They need to obviously be aware of this book. Privacy lawyers should. Human rights lawyers certainly because this issue is not going to go away. We will eventually have some revision to the Human Rights Act in some form or another when they finally get round to it. So it will be relevant. And of course, yes, journalists who will no doubt come to regard it as indispensable. I think it is and get it. Now, the publication date, as I said, is cited in October 2015. There's the book again. It's a heavy book. I've been delighted with it. I think it's the duty of confidence. Here we go. This is a lovely one. This has developed this concept of confidence has developed quite rapidly in the last 25, 30 years. I mean, I go back, say, 40 odd years in law, and com confidence was seen in a different way in those days. Then you've got the data, ah, oh, the lovely Data Protection Act, yes, 1998. All of these things, by the way, these pieces of legislation, the Brexit people will like to cause all sorts of problems and bring all these things up, but fact is we would have this legislation anyway let's be real about it but this book I think is particularly good I'd like to thank all the people involved and OUP thank you so much you do make our lives easier and I've enjoyed this book as you probably gather certainly Elizabeth did thank you to all bye bye